Hello, Texans, and welcome to the Fuddruckers Texans Players Show. Mark Vandermeer with you with DP Sidhu as we do this every Tuesday, not at Fuddruckers. Haven't been out there for a couple of years. It's still sort of a post-COVID, still in COVID, a little bit kind of year. So we're not at Fuddruckers, but we will be eventually at some point in history. So just stay tuned. We still have protocols going on with the players. We do have an X player. We don't call him that. We call him a Texans legend tonight, and it's a good one. It's a guy I've been wanting to catch up with for a long time. I actually saw him at the Taste of the Texans last night. It is Earl Mitchell. Earl, good evening. How's it going? Going great. Um, Appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, we had a lot of fun last night. Yeah, that was a that was a great event. And just tell me, because this is a Texans tradition, didn't happen last year because of COVID, but lots of restaurants there. Great cause. Houston Food Bank presented by Cisco. Uh, Did you get enough to eat, Earl? Because I know people were swarming you asking for autographs and things like that. Did you get enough to eat? You're still a big guy. Oh, yeah, I I definitely I made a couple of rounds. So uh, I got there early and uh, got to mingle with a lot of the people there and uh, definitely got plenty of food so i'm good (laughs) just hearing you earl i mean i feel like it was just yesterday that we were doing radio shows with you and mark was making um you know comments about what who who's very white very Very white white. in fact you would make very white comments when you went to the dolphins i called because i know people there earl i used to work there in south florida at the university of miami so i said listen when you get earl on the air you got to play barry white all right because he's used to that and he'll like that an awful lot i don't know if you do or not but i told them you would uh but yeah you do have the pipes earl there's no question about it you need a media career fast i appreciate it no that was like a running joke man because people kept playing barry white music (laughs) (laughs) poor earl I didn't know when people in Mark, San Francisco. I was, like, you start, I was like, you've started something that Earl did not ask for, and now he's going to be stuck with it. Yeah. So Earl, so Earl, you, you you come back as a Texans legend. We've sort of seen you around game days and, you know, a taste of the Texans. You know, for people that don't know, what is being a legend like? You know, what does that entail for you? What do your days look like these days, especially now that you're out of the league? Yeah, it's, it's really great. It's, um, it's really nice for me uh, just – personally uh you know being from houston and you know just to be a part of of the uh, legends program that where i can actually get out in the community uh, and do a lot of work with uh just you know people that's out there um you know just doing just things for the city whether you know we're passing out waters to people from the you know the uh the the winter storm that we had months ago and and just uh, kind of getting uh, opportunities to go to jack yates as they changed it to george Perry's field and just to be out there just to support anything that the Texans organization wants to do for the community and it makes me happy to be a part of it that's very cool now you went to North Shore and this is a legendary high school program Earl so have you been able to get to some North Shore games since you've been out of the league oh yeah I've been I've been going uh, just uh, supporting those kids and trying to like uh, give them some uh, inspirational words and uh, I look forward to all those kids, you know, have productive college careers and just want them to be, you know, elite, you know, student athletes when they get um, on the next level. So uh, I, I try to stay in touch with them as much as I can. Earl, over the weekend, you were inducted into the Ring of Honor um, at Arizona along with Brooks Reed. I saw them tweet about it. What was that experience like? How long had you known that you were going to be inducted into the Ring of Honor? And what what did the weekend sort of look like for you and Brooks out there? Yeah, last week was crazy. Um, I mean, last weekend actually, we just got back and um, it was a uh, it was a noon game. It was really hot and it was, uh, but it was fun to be out there with my old Texans teammate, old Arizona teammate, and just you know we we've always been side by side our entire careers. But uh, it was uh, really fun to be out there. It's been very nostalgic, and uh, yeah, we uh, you know just a huge honor for for both of us. You know, what, Earl, did you, what did they do for you? Did they have like a highlight reel or did they do any special festivities to sort of welcome you back? Yeah, they uh, so yeah, for our family there, they had a huge uh, tailgate uh, for us where they welcomed us back. And uh, we got uh, some, you know, some nice honorary uh, captain game balls. We got to go out there for the coin toss and, uh, you know, they revealed our names uh, on the you know, on the stadium uh, wall up top. And uh, yeah, our family got to come out there on the field and take a bunch of pictures. And 
you know, it was, uh, it was cool for it all to be documented. And, you know, we, we had a really good time out there, but yeah, it was, uh, like I said, it was cool, especially to be out there with Brooks. So Earl, you go to Arizona and this is one of the problems I think that the Texas schools have like the university of Texas, Texas A&M to start there that a guy like you from North shore high school ends up in Arizona to play college football. I know there are guys from Texas who go everywhere, but there you are North shore high school. Did you entertain the thought about going to Aggie land or the 40 acres or whatever else, whatever other opportunities you might've had here? Well, like, like I said, you know, it, I was, I was a fullback. I was getting recruited at fullback and, you know, I, and I, and, and trust me, I understand it was just a position where, you know, at the time, you know, 2006, we're looking for more speed and more wide receivers and stuff like that. So it was just a position that a lot of teams just really wasn't on the top of their list. So me and Brooks Reed, you know, for us both to be recruited as fullbacks, play fullbacks, it just kind of, you know, it just uh, kind of showed you how the game goes where we we were guy, big guys with speed. And eventually we both got moved over to defense just to kind of help accommodate that that change and what was happening with college football. So it worked out for both of us. I always wonder about that. If you're playing a position like fullback, that it's not really in high demand. Is there ever sort of this thought process of maybe I should switch to a different position or, or try to go into college at a different position? One that sort of opens up my options for where I can go to school. Like, did you ever think, I mean, you end up moving anyway to the defensive side of the ball, but was that a thought process when you were sort of looking at these schools that were recruiting you? It, um, I, I was kind of, uh, I guess I was a little bit uh, hard headed. I was, I really liked uh, playing fullback and I took a lot of pride in it. And I just felt like it was a position that not many people got to play or wanted to play. So it was like, oh, this is perfect for me because I'm, I just felt like I was very, you know, selfless in that way. But uh, what happens is we had, uh, you know, I was playing a lot of fullback and a lot of tight end. We changed our offense to a spread and we bring in uh, Rob Gronkowski. And that wow. kind of took out a lot of my more of my playing time. And so then we had two guys get hurt on the defensive line. And and ultimately that move, uh, they 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 called me and they said, Hey, we wouldn't we wouldn't do this if we didn't think you could and uh, we really need you and it's it's for the team. And that's what really sold me. And uh that's kind of what happened. It was just like the perfect, perfect storm of me eventually moving to defense. Former Texans defensive lineman Earl Mitchell joining us. All right, I have to ask, what was Gronk like in college? Pretty much the same kind of thing. What was he like? Same guy. The guy was like, he was just brought so much fun to the uh, to the film room. And, um, you know, we we were both just, uh, we, were, we, were, we were polar opposites. But, like, uh, it was really cool to get to play next to him and uh, just to watch him. I just knew that from the very first day he came in that he was going to be a star. And, uh, we we put him on the field. He ran a, a 15 yard dig route, and he uh, it was it was thrown way behind him. But he like reached back and just snatched it out the air and just ran to the end zone. And I just knew he was going to be special. You know, I saw him on the Manning the Manning cast a few weeks ago uh, on on Monday Night Football, and they were talking with him. And, and sometimes I can't tell if he's it's like a whole act that he has of oh I don't I don't watch film. I just Tom watches it and tells me what to do. Just like oh gosh. I just sort of go out there. But then I think, you know, is he just like super smart and he's just like playing everyone else? Like he knows exactly what he's doing or like you played alongside him. Does he, is he really just one of those guys that doesn't need to watch a lot of film? He's just such a natural instinctive player. Like I cannot quite figure out which one it is with him. I think, I do think it's a bit of a troll job with the fans. I, <laughs> I, I really think that he's a, you know, he's a really smart player, but he, he refuses to make it a, a game of uh, where where it's just is it's just too much to think about, and he just wants it to be as fun as it was when you were you know six years old trying to play. And I, and I think he does a really good job of keeping it to where it's supposed to be. It's fun. It's a fun game. It's always should be that way. And and I I think he I think he's he's great for doing that. So he's not secretly watching film at night, and then just he right. just really he just really does want to keep it fun and light. Right. Yeah, he's, he's pretty good at that. Earl Mitchell joining us on Texans Radio. Earl, let's go here. North Shore High School, we mentioned it. What makes North Shore so great? What makes North Shore the power that it is? I think it's the, the coaches. Uh, 
you know, Coach John Kay, he really puts those kids uh, through uh, intense workouts throughout the summer. Um, you know, I remember just watching it. It was it was crazy to see it years later where it's almost uh, borderline military style where these kids are well disciplined. Um, they understand their jobs. They come in and they're held accountable um, every single day, where whether it's from the classroom, uh, you know, to on the field and just knowing their assignments and and uh, going to college was just so much easier because I because I felt like I was you know taught so much discipline. I was taught so much that a lot of kids in high school didn't know, and I, I just felt so ready for every level once I. Uh, once I went to North Shore, I don't think I would have been, you know, the player that I was, as at least uh, from a focus standpoint, um, if I didn't uh, go go through the North Shore program. How many of your teammates at North Shore ended up going and playing ball in college and beyond in the NFL? Uh, we had a defensive back, Chucky Brown. He actually won a Super Bowl with the Ravens, Baltimore Ravens. Uh, then... Oh, yeah, Kevin Rutland, who was our quarterback, he ended up switching to defense also when he played for the Jacksonville Jaguars. We had um, Najee Torin. He played guard with me in San Francisco. Oh, uh, man, I'm trying to think of everyone. I, I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, but, yeah, we had a, we had a number of players. Um, I think that's that's all I could think of from, from right now. Yes. All right, you, you- – all right, go ahead, DB. I was going to say, so you had a teammate from high school and you played with him in the NFL, like later on in your career. How cool was that? That was really cool. Like, but to, for me, it was the guys that I used to see on the walls. Like we had Corey Redding. He played for the Detroit Lions. Uh, he was drafted uh, wow. years. Um, we had uh, Andre Gerard. And to play against those guys was uh, probably the ultimate dream because I used to look at the wall at North Shore and, and want to be those guys one day and just to shake their hand on the field was was a pretty epic moment for me. Earl Mitchell joining us. All right, you're drafted by the Texans in 2010, and your rookie season is not a big success here. You got off to a good start, 4-2. and two. We know what happened down the stretch, finish up 6-10, and 10, and that was when the Texans were still a 4-3, and then the 3-4 arrives with Wade Phillips, and the talk was, is Earl big enough to be a nose tackle in Wade's three, four? What was that transition like for you and moving to that spot and contributing the way you did? What was that whole thing like, Earl? Yeah, you know, uh, once again, it was just it was just a mental thing about changing positions and uh, wondering if I could do it. I mean, I, but I felt like I've been through this process mentally before, whether it was, you know, changing from fullback to, you know, defense and now changing from a, a – um, a, a three technique to a nose tackle taking double teams and uh so yeah it was a uh, it was a bit of a transition but I I was excited about it when I heard uh Wade Phillips when he came in and people asked him about you know your nose tackle position and he says you know we don't have to worry about it we have Sean Cody and Earl Mitchell and when I heard that that gave me a lot of confidence because I hadn't even met him yet and he's watched the film and you know him giving me that confidence you know it it, it allowed me to feel a little bit more comfortable by I would call guys like Jay Ratliff guys who've been at his defense before and kind of get pointers on his thoughts and you know and what made him so successful because we were similar in size and stature do you think it's harder for a defensive lineman to go from a three four to a four three or the other way around well it depends I think um I think that from way Phillips game it was definitely uh similar to an over front and it kept things a little bit more simple but if you're playing like a two gap where you're head up on offensive linemen it's it's easier to be massive and you could uh, you could play a straight up zero technique on centers or you could play head up uh, on on the offensive tackles who are very big in this league but uh Wade Phillips uh he he had a scheme where you could be still very attack mode and and um and, uh, and you can benefit from having smaller guys in his defense. And that's what made us, uh, you know, really successful those years he was there. Earl Mitchell joining us. All right, Sean Cody, we know about him. Were you ever a guest on On the Nose, his video series? Yeah, I was. <laughs> it was pretty funny because I wasn't sure where we were going with his shows and, and his direction, but just he was, he was always really hilarious with his, uh, his shows. 
What was your reaction uh, when J.J. Watt shows up his rookie year in camp? He starts knocking passes down. That's the first sign we saw that he was J.J. Watt, J.J. Swat, whatever. And he really didn't explode until the postseason that year. But what were your early impressions of Watt? Well, I, I just kind of similar to what I thought when I saw uh, Gronkowski. I knew that he had a lot of star potential and um and he was just a very natural instinctive player and he just made a lot of plays that that we got used to at practice and you know once he started doing them in the game every day it's just it was cool to see him just keep continue to grow and watch him uh just his uh personality develop on the field and he was just a you know dynamic player to play with one of one of the best I've ever seen part one of the hardest workers ever to you know play with and you know, I'm, I'm I'm really glad that I got to, uh, you know, watch him develop and be, be, be his teammate. I read an interview and I think you might have been with Drew Doherty where you said that the loudest game that you'd ever been a part of and you've been a part of some really big games in your career, including the Super Bowl. But the loudest game that you'd ever been a part of was the 2011 playoff game against the Bengals. Yeah. Is that is that still very much the case? And is it true that you tell other teammates about how loud it was at NRG Stadium back then? Definitely. Like when when I went to the Dolphins and we hadn't been to the playoffs uh, and when I went to, uh, to the Niners, the team was very young. Like every time I would talk about the playoffs, I would always bring up the first time the Texans went to the playoffs for the first time. And that was the loudest game I ever been a part of and couldn't hear a thing. And just uh, that place was just rocking. I think all the fans knew how loud it was going to be and that they knew how important that day was. And it was just a, it was just really cool to see the entire city to be a part of that game because they were very much, uh, you know, part of uh, us beating the Bengals that, that, that weekend. And beating the Bengals earlier, a few weeks earlier, as you clinched the division for the first time ever, Earl, in the locker room, watching the Saints and Titans close out their game, that moment of clinching, take us through that. I think we uh we we were just super excited to you know get the opportunity to you know go into the playoffs and I remember uh especially uh Kevin Walters getting this uh, opportunity to go back you know he's played there for a number of years but mm -hmm. you know, it was just a really cool moment just to you know just to have our team you know be a part of that because I remember when I was a kid and watching the Texans be unveiled as the the, the team of the city and and just uh you know, not having a, a clue that I would actually be a part of it one day, but to be a, a part of the actual first playoff run is, uh, you know, you know, something I'm truly proud of. I think that's really cool because you are from Houston, you grew up here and then you get drafted by the hometown team. So, you know, what were your early memories like watching the Texans growing up? Uh, I just, I remember uh, it was like, for a few weeks, uh, there was like a big things on the news of what the actual name of the team was going to be and I remember for a, a number of weeks I remember uh, Ballers was at the top of the list and I was, <laughs> was that a choice <laughs> was, that would have been that, amazing <laughs> read that about five years from now <laughs> <laughs> but I'm yeah, I was uh, I just remember like uh just uh, it, but even when the big drum roll of like what the name was going to be it was like the Houston Texans and everybody was like hmm <laughs> it was really it, it seemed pretty simple but then like once like we like really bought in and we saw the logo and everybody really got excited and I just remembered the city just being really excited to have a, a team back because you remember those five years without football I mean I think I moved I moved during the Oilers last year in Houston that was my first year in, in, and I went to an Oilers game um, mm -hmm. in that final season. And then there was that five-year stretch of like no football. You'd get random games on Sundays. You'd, we'd get a lot of Cowboys games, which I thought yeah. how offensive to people in Houston. Like I'd only lived here for a minute and I knew enough to know that people in Houston didn't really want to watch Cowboys games unless they were Cowboys fans. But right. then to have that, to be, to be able to like have football come back to the city, how excited were you as a kid just to be able to have a hometown team again? No, it was cool. Like I just remember even when I got drafted because like, even then around that time there wasn't a lot of Texans gear to like go and then I remember like having arguments about people like yeah it was like there's another team in Texas like the Texans and but like to even go to the store and like trying to find like uh 
you know, a Texan jerseys or Texan hat, you know, just for family members. And it was just always just like Dallas or the Saints and either or like people who were so still used to not having a Texans team that they got used to just rooting for other people's cities. But uh, I was uh, I was glad that once we got into the playoffs, things started like you start seeing a whole lot more and more and more. And I was, uh, you know, I was uh, I was glad that people were really finally starting to embrace the the Texans. Earl Mitchell joining us uh, back to that celebration day when you clinched for the first time against the Bengals, December 2011. Were you part of the group that went outside at Bud Light Plaza after the arrival back home? No, I didn't. I didn't get to be a part of that. I did see. Uh, I remember like Sean Cody and Cody Bar <laughs> getting everybody riled up, though. That was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty funny. All right. So the next year, Texans finish 12 and four, go to the playoffs. All right, we talked about the good times. I need some perspective though here, Earl, because you also went through one of the toughest seasons in the history of the franchise. And we're going through a tough year right now. 2013, you start out two and zero, and you lose 14 straight to end the season at two and 14. What do you remember about that? And look, I know things turned around the next year for the Texans. You weren't a part of it that year you were with Miami at that time. And you mentioned you had some good times with, with the dolphins, but what about that year getting to getting through 2013 and what that was like? Yeah. What I remember about that season is just kind of dealing with a lot of adversity. That was like my first time kind of witnessing what it's like to deal with uh, major injuries uh, amongst the team. And uh, I remember, uh, I think, I believe uh, Matt Schaub had a, had an injury that was a, uh, kind of lingering with him and then Arian Foster went down and 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 ultimately I felt like our office really kind of uh surrounded him and uh and what happens uh like what happens when you have like that one piece of the puzzle missing and uh it was uh it was um you know really it was hard to like uh, be a part of but like for me it was my le- my last season there and I was just uh, just really just uh, working my butt off, just uh, trying my best because I wanted to, you know, stay and be a part of the team. But uh, it was uh, it was definitely um, it was it was it was tough. But I just remember the practices just being, you know, uh, very still energetic and nobody uh, nobody nobody stopped, you know, fighting hard. And it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was a it was a weird um, transition because everybody had such high expectations for us that year. How, how hard is it in the locker room to sort of keep everyone together? Because at some point in the season, it did seem like every single week felt winnable. It felt like a winnable game. But then after so many losses, you sort of know that you're out of the playoffs and it's not it's not going to be like it was in 2011 or 2012. But mentally, how do you stay in that mindset of we got to still go out and we still got to compete and not to lose the focus in that locker room? How hard is that and how does that get done? Yeah, that can that can be really tough. Um, you know, I don't know if uh, you know, if um, a lot of people understand, but I know for me personally, with it being my my last season, I'm putting everything out there, and I and that, my my that season unfortunately was my my best season uh, with uh, with Texans because I just felt like we were, um, you know, I was uh, doing my best to you know remain on the team at that point. But uh, I know that uh, everybody else was just trying to like just keep spirits high, especially from practice standpoint, um, and um, just knowing that with the people that we had, the talent that we had, like there was uh, no way that we should have been, you know, dealing with those losses or, or yeah, like we were. So it's um, yeah, it, it was unfortunate, but like we knew that we were much better than what we were. So it was just a uh, you know kind of you know a lot of uh, hard pills to swallow up that year, but. I think that it was just one, it was just sometimes, sometimes you have to embrace um, the situations that you have. You came in with Kareem and also John Weeks on the Texans. Now Kareem is still in the league, but he's with Denver. Weeks is still a Houston Texan. Does that blow your mind a little bit? A little bit, a little bit. It was (laughs) cool to see that he's still, still there. Um, I remember when I, you know, first became part of the Legends group, uh, I was, you know, I was talking to uh, Jared Crick and Tim Jameson about just, you know, just seeing the last few guys, the last of the Mohicans out there, just, yeah, uh, yeah, J- JJ Hopkins in weeks, and now it's just weeks, and he's he's the one that's really just uh, holding it down for us. <laughs> All right, Earl Mitchell is with us. Next up, we'll give away a Fuddruckers gift card. It'll be based on something you heard in this segment about Earl. Also, after Earl leaves the Texans, he goes to Miami, goes to San Francisco. 
also Seattle. What was all that like? We'll find out and find out more of what Earl's up to today as the Fuddruckers Texans Player Show continues on Texans Radio. It's the Fuddruckers Texans Player Show. Mark Vandermeer and D.P. Sidhu with you. And Earl Mitchell is our guest tonight. North Shore High School, Arizona, Houston Texans, drafted in 2010. And I kind of just gave away one of the answers. No, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to pivot. Here, I was going to ask what college did Earl girl to go to, but I just gave it to you. So here's the question. Name one of the other NFL teams, just one of the other NFL teams that Earl played for, okay? Not Miami, okay? There are two others because I'm about to ask him about the Dolphins. So two other possibilities here where Earl made stops in the National Football League and get the answer right first at Texans Radio at HoustonTexans.com. Go ahead and send the email. Texans Radio at HoustonTexans.com. That's Texans Radio at HoustonTexans.com for the Fuddruckers gift card. Okay, Earl, you go to the Dolphins in 2014. Was it culture shock? What was it like living in South Florida? You lived in Houston. You grew up here. You go to Arizona. There you are at Tucson. Then you're back here to play pro football. Going to South Florida. What was it like? All right, this this is the first time in my life I feel like I'm by myself. I don't really know anyone. I guess I, college didn't really count because when you get recruited, you kind of get lobbed in with all these freshman recruits, and you know they do a good job of making sure you know each other. But now you're a grown man. I was in Miami, and I didn't really know anyone on the team, and uh, it was a uh, it was different because the Texans at the time was a very much older team. Uh, it was uh, weird when I first came in as a rookie. You got these guys, They after the games, they go home with their families. And um, everybody just kind of, you know, just hangs out and everybody just chills. But when I got to Miami, the team was very young. They go they, they, they go out, they hang out. And uh, and I was, uh, I, I guess they, they would call me OG. I was the OG. Because uh, I would just go home right after, because that's what I was used to. But everybody wanted to hang out. But it was uh, definitely a culture shock, very different team, very much younger team. <laughs> It was a new coaching staff too. I'm looking, I'm looking up now, new coaching staff, new general manager. What was that like? I mean, you were, you've been a part of another a team with a different coaching staff, but what was it like getting to a new team as they're going through a transition? Yeah, it was a, uh, it was an interesting time. Um, you know, I think uh, the Dolphins were, you know, really looking uh, to, uh, I guess, change their culture. Um, they were kind of like, kind of, kind of pushing towards what more of the what the Texans have done and and looking for more I guess uh leadership in the locker room from that standpoint but it was uh it was it was a uh, it was fun because I got to be a part of a younger crew who got to count who got to change the culture there and we eventually got uh to the wild card uh I believe in uh 2016 but yeah it was a uh, it was a uh, it was a uh, it was it was a fun time for sure very different experience Okay, now in 2015, you're on that Dolphin team that blew out the Texans. And we <laughs> talked a bit about this game last week <laughs> because we were playing the Dolphins last week. And that was the last time the Texans went down there until this past week. So oh, that yeah. was strange. That was bizarre to see the performance the Texans put up that day. I know it was a different coach than you played for in Houston, but you knew a lot of the guys on the team, Earl. And that must have been weird. That was really tough, man. You know, because... I remember um, Dan Campbell. He actually was uh, he was the interim head coach at that point. And man, this guy was very fiery, very passionate. And man, he really made you want to play for him. And I have so much respect for that guy. But uh, before before that game, he just goes up in front of the team and he's like, he's like, yeah, I really wish I could be out there with you guys. I bleed for you guys. He said, we're gonna. We're going to watch this tape, this highlight tape. And afterwards, Earl's going to come down here and speak. And I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. like somebody was going to tell me this. <laughs> but at that point, it was just like, wow, like I have no idea what to say. This is my old team. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for these guys. <laughs> like, and during the whole time he's playing that tape, I have no idea what I'm going to say. And it was, it was, uh, it was a very rough week for me, man. <laughs> but he, but he must have thought it was going to be a revenge, revenge match for you. You know, you know, and honestly, like a revenge I, game. I, and I went down, I went down there, and I did give like a revenge speech. I gave him what he wanted, but I'll be honest, like it was a, it was a moment of like, what am I, what am I supposed to say? 
I have so much respect for J.J. Watt and Whitney Merciless and everybody on that team. So I just – I kind of went down there and winged it and just gave him what he wanted. But, man, those uh, – I, I know those kids were fired up and and uh, and really excited to play that game. So um, – and, you know, I, 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 I do feel like they did it for me because they knew how much uh, this uh, organization, you know, the Texans uh, meant to me. So – that was a it was a hard that was a tough game for me to be honest to to watch. <laughs> and to what, be a, I, I was gonna say, what was the week leading up to it like for you? Because you're watching film of all these guys that you've played with before. So when you say it's it was hard for you, like m- mentally, what is that week? How is it different from other weeks that you're preparing for for a, for a team? Um, it, it was um, it was it was it's very weird to sit in the room and watch. And listen to coaches uh, how they critique your teammates uh, from oh, from, wow. from years past, and uh, that was a very um, uh, you know it's it's interesting because it makes you wonder what people have, uh, say about you. what they, what, they, what the Texans were saying about me. Sure, sure. And so uh, yeah, and um, but yeah, it was just like you know, hey, we have Aaron Foster here, yeah, yeah, and like everything I know, I practice against this guy every single day, and they're going to get doing the uh, critique of the offensive line everything is just like it was um it was it was like you, you feel like you're in an alternate universe you know like <laughs> I got it so much so yeah it was it was interesting but fun All dan right. campbell are you surprised about how how things are going for him in detroit uh yeah i am yeah, he's uh you know he's a tough fiery coach and i know that he has uh, the ability to bring you know to bring out that passion that he has into players because i felt that and um and uh, i do really wish him a lot of success because he's uh he's somebody who's well deserving he's he's a you know he's a extremely hard worker and uh, he's very passionate and he and he um brings a lot of uh, you know he brings a lot of what football should be to the to the sport Earl Mitchell joining us. All right, so we talked about the culture shock of going to Miami to play for the Dolphins. Then you go to the San Francisco 49ers, and in some ways it's got to feel like home because a lot of Texans are there. So take us through that, Earl. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was really fun. Um, I believe uh, uh, as soon as I uh, left Miami, uh, I get a phone call for four days later from Jeff Scanina. And, you know, he's, uh, he's been in the NFL for 17 years. He's... Uh, He's played for the Texans uh, for a number of years as well. And uh, he told me that he had the, the head D line job and, mm-hmm. and he's like, Hey, I need your veteran presence, man. And, and um, you know, and they, they, uh, they also said, uh, Hey, we're, we're going to have D'Amico call you. And I was like, D'Amico who? <laughs> I was like, only, <laughs> only no one D'Amico. And I was just like, wow, you guys are really, uh, you know, bringing in like my, my teammates. One, I feel old. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm getting, being coached by my teammates and also it was just a cool experience to see if that's something that I can see myself transitioning to as well just to yeah and just to kind of pick their ear about what what life is like after the game potentially because I feel like now I'm kind of closing in on my career but it was it was fun to you know be a part of uh the, the Niners because it just felt like the West Coast Texans and Robert Sala was there too right of course Sala yeah Kyle Shanahan uh, um, Coach Hightower, he was there. Uh, Ray White, oh, yeah. Ray, team's coach. It was a lot of. Uh, I mean, the uh, strength and conditioning coach. So every a lot of a uh, lot of familiar uh, faces there. Was Mike Lafleur there yet, Matt's brother? He, I believe he was. Yes, he was. Okay. He was the uh, passing coordinator. Yeah, and he's with the Jets now as their offensive coordinator. They're going to be here November twenty eighth, so you can say hello to everybody again. Uh, as you're a Texans legend now, but I find it interesting, this Texans coaching tree, and you didn't play for Vic Fangio in the early days, but he's the head coach at Denver. It was a defensive coordinator here. You have Mike Vrabel, who he also didn't play for, but he's with Tennessee. So you have guys from different regimes with different teams and a lot of former Texans out there. I guess a lot of teams can say that, but it seems like the Texans have more than most. For sure. You had, because when, when I was in Houston, you had Vance Joseph, but he came to Miami so a lot of the stuff was the same. So it just uh, you you realize how small the world actually is when you when you actually get your foot in the door for the NFL. But you know a lot of a lot of coaching changes and a lot of guys kind of just take guys with them uh, as they go around the carousel as well. Earl, when you were working as a player, you noticed what the coaches were doing. Did you ever entertain then the idea of coaching, or was it a non-starter with the hours they work and the lives they lead? 
you know, the, uh, it was always a um, non-negotiable. Like I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm like, I'm never coaching. I, like I, I would see the work they're putting in. I got a lot of respect for them um, and I appreciate what they do, but it's just, it was just like, man, this, it's a lot. And, um, but uh, it was when I heard uh, D'Amico and I went and seeing Jessica Nina coaching is when they gave me the idea that, uh, that I might uh, want to look into it. And then, and once I kind of saw it all over again, I was like, no, I'm okay. I'm, I don't want to. <laughs> all right. Er- Earl Mitchell joining us on the Fuddruckers Texans Players Show. One more segment with him. We'll talk about what's up now and some other plans he might have. I want to ask him about former players, Texans legends, the rest of it here on the Fuddruckers Texans Players Show on Texans Radio. Mark Vandermeer, DP Sidhu with you on the Fuddruckers Texans Players Show. Our guest tonight, by the way, the answer was uh, either Miami. Well, actually, I, I eliminated Miami for the other NFL teams that Earl played for. San Francisco, we would have taken Seattle as well. And then you have San Francisco again at the very end. What was Seattle like, Earl? I don't remember much about that. Yeah, I had a had a brief stop there. I went there uh, in, uh, for training camp. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened there was just uh you know they needed uh some they had some depth issues and um when i when i went there i really enjoyed it honestly um the it was just very it was a very different experience being coached by coach carol and uh being there with um you know russell wilson and watching those guys play but they they're very high energy um you know their their fans really really love the seahawks and you know, everywhere I went, everybody would just come up to me and just be like, "Are you a hawk? Hey, are you a hawk?" <laughs> but um, I, uh, it was a, it was a, it was an interesting time. I just, uh, I, I wish that, uh, I wish that honestly, I wish I was younger when I came to that team because I was so used to being very business, and the, the Texans have taught me a very focused approach. Where Seattle kind of is very more playful, and uh, mm-hmm. it was, uh, it was, it was fun, but it was different, and. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed my my time there. So I have it here that you announced your retirement in November. So a couple of months go by, you don't catch on. You announce your retirement, yet you re-sign with the 49ers just for the playoffs. This is like a player's dream, Earl. Yeah. <laughs> sign me for the postseason and take me to the Super Bowl. And that's what happened. Yeah, man. It was uh it was it was it was one of the craziest moments ever. It was the best three weeks of my life. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but I was at home all season. I was just not, and honestly, I wasn't really paying too much uh, attention to, to the game. And, um, uh, the, what happened was, uh, I was, uh, I was, I'm at home and John Lynch, he gives me a call. He tells me a couple of guys got injured and he, he's like, Hey, do you, do you think that you can come back and help us? And, and at that point, I, I, I wasn't, it wasn't working out a whole lot. And uh, I had to think about it. Uh, what, what happened was um, as soon as I got off the phone with him, the Seahawks called me right after, and they were going to uh, Pittsburgh the next week. And they were like, we need you to come now. And that's when I called John Lynch back and said, Hey, see, uh, see, I'll just call me. And, and we, and I'm, I'm telling them that I want to come back to San Francisco. So it was, it was a, that was a very quick, you know, decision that I had to make, but, um, but I'm, I'm so happy that I came back and, and I got to, um, you know, play in the Super Bowl. So how did you go from like eating potato chips on your couch to being playoff or I don't know if you're eating potato chips on your couch, but clearly you're retired. You're in retired mode. You're not thinking you're going to play football, but how do you bounce back into shape with these guys that have been playing a full season, they're football ready. And then now you got to get ready for the playoffs. You know, I think that a part of it was just, um, it was, you know, like riding a bike, but at this point, it's the end of the season. A lot of guys are banged up and I think it kind of like evened out with me. He <laughs> just kind of eating <laughs> chips, <laughs> <laughs> but I was definitely a uh, sore. Um, I, um, I was, I, I, I was just focused on my flexibility. I was just uh, running every day at that point or when I, as soon as I came back and, uh, you know, and I was just, uh, you know, I only got to, uh, to play about maybe like six to uh, eight snaps a, a game. Uh, those, but it was it was the it was it was really nice. It was um you know no no pressure. I just went out there and I I just uh, did my contribution and um yeah it was it was it was really cool to be a part of it. Now the last game that you ever played in was the Super Bowl, correct? 
Yes. Wow. So why? Okay. So that's, I mean, that's a great, that's a great ending to your, the NFL chapter of your life. But did you think, you know what? I could probably still come back and play. Like I've, you know, did it leave you hungry to want to come back or did it sort of solidify like, no, now I'm ready to retire. Yeah. I think um, you know, the, the way it ended, you know, just kind of, you know, playing in Miami and I got to, you know, get a sack in the Super Bowl, um, Patrick Mahomes and, you know, and it was just, um, you know, I think that it was just a, a, a moment that was like really, it was good enough for me because I was, I was just satisfied. I was never someone who was, you know, always like, uh, you know, trying to be in the limelight or, um, or, you know, just trying to be like, you know, selfish with the, the idea because, um, you know, this game is a, that is a game where, you know, it just, it just keeps going. And I was, I was proud of my backup for how, how how great he became while he was there and he he helped them get to the Super Bowl and um you know and I and I he you know, I even wore his number in the Super Bowl uh just uh you know just to kind of just it was just a you know just a part of the you know just a part of the switch you know that I just felt like he should be a part of it too but um but yeah it was uh, really cool to you know let that be my final game and you know and honestly that that's getting that sack is probably the the greatest memory that I'll, that I'll ever have as a football player what a great way to end it other than you didn't win the game yeah, could have should have very close game yeah. look we are so painfully familiar with having a lead against the 49ers and being on a I mean against the Chiefs and being unable to hang on to it as that's what happened to you guys but uh <laughs> but a great way to end the career Earl for sure for sure all right was, uh, so all right go ahead I'm sorry no, I was just saying, I was just, I was, I was definitely happy to be there. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right. So Earl, uh, you're a Texans legend. We appreciate that. I know you do events and everything. Any other plans that we need to know about? Because we want to stay in touch here. We're going to talk to you a lot more, especially with those pipes, Earl. This is good. <laughs> 34 years old. You got a long future with these pipes. Oh man, that's funny. Um, no, I'm I'm very much in tune with uh, you know, what we're doing with the uh, Texans Legends right now. Um, I, I love uh doing work in the community and and that's really where I'm at right now. But uh, yeah, that's uh, if um if there's any anything that's going on that I could be affiliated with the city, um, at any capacity, that's uh that's that's my passion right now. All How right. did you decide to move back to Houston over Miami or San Francisco? Oh. Well, I, I still actually have a spot out there. Uh, <laughs> but, so That's I'm, the way I'm to back, do it. I'm back and forth, but, you know, especially during the season. Uh, but, but once the all season hits, I'll be out there a little bit. But um, I still come out here. I spend time with my family. Uh, my sister, she just had a, uh, another baby. So I'm, uh, yeah, so I'm just sticking around right for now and just, uh, you know, watching watching her twins grow and just spending time with them. Earl, thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. No problem. Earl Mitchell joining us on the Fuddruckers Texans Players Show. Texans All Access on the way. Go Texans.